impact you, and I would recommend that you get a copy of this or at least look online at the village's website. Um, I also have a topic in there called contracts, another one on our uh, voice messaging that Jim Thomas will be talking about later, and a little bit on road maintenance. Uh, the other topic that I'd like to just mention, <coughs> this is the middle of winter. I fully expect it to snow again before the spring thaw. There was an article in the St. Paul Pioneer Press. It's dated uh, December 15th. And the topic was St. <coughs> Paul snowstorm aftermath. Help us help you, city pleads. With more snow in the forecast, street crews are asking for assistance and patience. Uh, as I read that article, I thought that it, most of it could have been written directing, uh, directed right to the residents of North Hudson. Um, snow plowing is not an easy task. I had the opportunity recently to sit up high in one of those big snow-moving machines. It's quite a sight. The world is quite uh, different as seen from up there. And I couldn't help but think about what it's like for those uh, fellows running the snow plows trying to get our roads clean. I did get a couple of phone calls, as did the, uh, the staff here at the village. Uh, some were complaining about the snow removal because their driveway got plowed in. I actually had one resident and a friend of mine say, I think the village did too good a job shoveling the snow. And I found that to be an amusing comment. And he said, is there any money left in the budget? They did such a good job. And so I, I took that as sort of a left-handed compliment, and I <laughs> appreciated that. Um, perhaps you're not aware, and that's why, and I've had uh, chats with Mark Eckblad, who is our supervisor of public works. The first goal is to have two paths cut through every road to make sure that emergency vehicles of any kind can get down your street and get to your neighbor's house. The next thing they have to do is go in and then clean up after those two lanes have been cut. And it's wide enough for a fire truck to get by or an ambulance. And uh, I know that inconveniences some people because their driveway gets pushed in. I will also admit to having shaken my fist at the uh, snow plow as they plowed my driveway in right after I finished cleaning it out. But that's the nature <coughs> of living here in the Northland where we do get the snow. We apologize for that. But there are over 1,260 driveways, and we can't have expect our snow plow crew to be plowing out 1260 driveways we ask for your patience and cooperation in that and while we're talking about cooperation another issue that keeps coming up is cars parked in the street when there's a snowstorm so play out the scenario you parked your car in the street it began to snow you didn't move your car and it got snowed in and the chances are pretty good that the snow plow is going to go down your street before you need to dig out your car uh, that's only logical that they'll go down the street first to make it clear, make a clear path for you and your car. Then you dig out your car, and the snow plow comes by, and now you see a big pile of snow where your car used to be. But that snow plow pushes all that snow into your driveway and your neighbor's driveways. And that's why cities like St. Paul and Hudson have snow emergency routes and have programs whereby if you don't move your car when it's starting to snow and the snow plow has to come through and your car is in the way, it will be towed. I would hope that we don't have to get to that point here in the village. And I'll leave it at that. I hope that you would remove your cars, put it in a driveway or put it somewhere off of the street so that the snow removal people can do their job efficiently. I am now going to get off my soapbox and I'm going to get behind the podium so that I can recognize the, the over 30 years of service that Jim O'Connor has given this village. So if you'll give me just a moment. Hi, Jim. Hi, Come on up to the podium. <coughs> I have a couple of things to say about this young man. <coughs> I took some notes on your career with this uh, village. And I, I've known Jim for over 32 years. And I didn't realize that he has been working 
on the village's behalf since long before I moved here. He was a building inspector back in the 70s and until, as the record that I have, until 1978. Um, let's see, your village trustee. And uh, that was back around 1978. And in a letter that Jim sent me, he said, but I consider my primary contribution to the village to have been on the planning commission serving for 30 years until 2003. And I, I'm ashamed to admit that I don't remember that. But 30 years, that is a, that's, quite a, that's quite a term, Jim. And we thank you for that. The zoning uh, subdivision and conditional use procedures the commission implemented guided the village's rapid growth during the 70s, 80s, and 90s. That is approximately 24 years of service in that capacity. Jim was also the library rep, uh, uh, the village's library rep from 2002 to 2010, and was the president of that body. Uh, Jim, I have a certificate here that I am going to only show you for right now because I want to put this in a frame. And it, we got a little behind, and so I didn't get the frame. And this certificate says, for four decades of committed service to the village of North Hudson as a member of the Village Board of Trustees, Plan Commission, Library Board, and for serving as the building inspector and village assessor. And Becky and I went through quite a few graphics to see if we could capture a picture that would depict Jim's many jobs for the village. And there's an old phrase, he wore many hats. And so we found a little graphic that shows a guy with multiple hats. Yes, you do. And Jim, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your service to this village. And I want to continue to do this during the course of 2011, recognizing those people who have been public servants. Most of our public servants receive no remuneration for their service. And I understand that. That's the law. And it's time that we start to recognize these people. And I couldn't think of anybody better to kick off the year with than to recognize Jim. And so I thank you. And Jim, the microphone is yours if you'd like to say anything. Well, thank you, George. And uh, we'd like to take a couple of minutes and reflect upon how far the village has come. When I decided to move to North Hudson in 1967, a, the village was basically two blocks either side of Highway 35. Well, I found a lot up on what was a patch of what was then Oakwoods before the wilt hit on Helen Street, two doors from where George is now. In those days, I had to come to the village board once a month and they issued the building permits. So that was in the, still in the reign of Dan Zezza. And so I came and asked for a building permit. I asked, had to answer some questions like, why do you want to move way up there? That's the frontier. <laughs> but they gave me a permit. I built and settled in. And uh, by the early 70s, a few apartment buildings started popping up. And some people objected to where they were going, and that's because we had no zoning. And uh, so the village formed a planning commission, and since I've been one of the agitators for it, I got appointed to it and stayed with it for 30 years. But those were good years for the village. I enjoyed working with a lot of good people there, and we worked through the issues. We got zoning set up, we got floodplain set up, uh, subdivision, conditional use, and provided some structure to the uh, village. I'm going to also mention why other services have come along as well. When I came to the village, we did have police protection. Friday and Saturday nights, the officer drove his personal car on patrol, and that was it. <laughs> so a lot of things have improved. But I worked with good people in the village. I felt uh, honored to be able to participate in these events. And uh, I'd like to conclude with a few words on the library. The new library has been a great success. Everybody likes it as we knew they would. 
And the library provides a lot of services to the village residents that may not always be recognized. For instance, last year, village residents had 37,000 circulations out of our library. Divide that by the village population and it comes out to 10 items, some 10 circulations for every person in the village. Another way to look at 37,000 is if each item was one inch thick, that would be a bookshelf over 3,000 feet long. I scaled that out the other day and 3,000 feet is from the village hall to the Freedom Gas Station. So that's a lot of books and other services that the village got out of the library. It's not just books. It's uh, computers and internet for those who don't have them at home. It's children's programs, teen activities, magazines, newspapers, audios and DVDs. Like last year they ran a series of um, job seeking uh, seminars for those looking for jobs. And when times are not the best, the library is all the more important to all the area residences. They can get free information, entertainment, make job resumes, do job searches. It's all on the internet these days. And if they don't have it at home, we've got high speed internet at the library for them. That's the good news. But there I have to temper it with uh, some bad news, and that is, is that the library's financial picture is unsustainable. This year, the library will run a deficit of $100,000, principally because of the additional rent for the new facility. The library is only able to do this because it accumulated a surplus while it was getting ready for this expansion. But that surplus will be gone in three years, and that will be crunch time for everybody if no actions are taken in the meantime. So I encourage you in the next budget cycle to <coughs> provide for incremental increases in library support, as well as the other uh, three municipalities, of course. But the library is doing a lot for the village residents, and certainly it deserves your support, and um, ask your consideration in that direction. So thank you very much. Thank you. George. Beautiful. I will hand I will deliver this to you tomorrow after I put a frame around it. Okay. okay. Thank you, Jim. Um I had planned on uh, having Dave Holt come up here this evening also. Uh, Dave was called away and was not able to be here. Um, Dave is, uh, as many of the residents know, Dave and his wife Barb are moving uh, from the village. Uh, and uh, he will no longer be able to serve as our water utility representative. And so we have a similar certificate. Uh, for Dave, for five years of valued service to the village of North Hudson as the village's representative to the Hudson Public Utilities Commission. And uh, the picture on that one, of course, is a little well, a little water well. So I will see to it that Dave gets that. All right. And that's all I have for now. And while I'm getting back to my seat, Becky, would you... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Got to go back to Gloria. Gloria, administrators. Uh, Thank you. Um, you'll see in front of you a budget analysis uh, document. Uh, please take this uh, with you and review it uh, briefly. Um, we still have some revenues that are filtering in for 2010 and, of course, more expenses. Uh, I think that we're going to end up still in the black, but just barely. And um, if you, um, speaking of the snowstorm, we, I, Mark Eckblad and I went through some of the cost uh, for this last storm and what the um, it has cost the village, and we're estimating about thirty-five thousand dollars. 
when you get done with all the extra fire or snow control. 35,000? Snow removal. 35,000? Yes, when you talk overtime, all the snow removal, everything. Oh. Um, I did, uh, and that's, but that's not for the whole year or by budget line item. That's everything together. Um, I think that uh, we're probably going to be over budget in that line item, but we're under budget in the salt purchase item and um, in the public works uh, department total, we're going to be, we should be okay. And village overall, I think we're going to still be somewhere in the, in the black, but like I said, not by much. Well, moving water is expensive, isn't it? Yeah. Um, before we go into this, I... Does it sound high? I'll wait till Becky's done. Yeah, Becky? Okay. Um, just wanted to make a clarification regarding the uh, collection of Christmas trees. Uh, for the past several years, the village has provided through the garbage hauler collection of uh, Christmas trees after the holidays. And despite the notice that was in the garbage bills that came out recently, um, that collection will be taking place again this year. So free collection of garbage, of garbage, of Christmas trees will take place um, every Friday in the month of January. So that would be the 7th, the 14th, the 21st, and the 28th. Violia will come around on Friday, those are all Fridays, and they will collect um, Christmas trees that are not in bags and are not wrapped in plastic. So remove any plastic from your tree before you put it out at the curb and have those out by 6.30 and they will be collected at no charge. And then I just wanted to um, let everybody know that the deadline for filing for municipal office um, was 5 o'clock today and we have uh, one candidate who is our incumbent uh, president for the village board, George Klein. So George will be on the ballot again this, this next for the next term. Uh, we have three trustees who will be on the ballot, and that are we have two incumbents who are Colleen O'Brien Berglund and Mark Zappa. Um, Joe has decided not to run for re-election this time, and we will have um, a new candidate on the ballot, and that is Dan Ortner. So, those will be the three names that you will see on the ballot for trustee. I'm sorry. Mark. I, I meant, did I mention Mark? No, yeah. you said. I think yeah, she yeah. Okay. Mark. I'm sorry. Yes, Colleen, Mark, and then Dan Ortner will be the three, as well as our municipal judge, uh, Ben Wolpett, will also be running again. So, And then the last item I have is just a quick reminder to residents that um, it's that time of year again for dog and cat owners to come in and get your dog and cat licenses. The forms are also available on the website, so make sure you get those uh, licenses taken care of and you bring your rabies information in with you when you come. That's all I have. Thank you, Becky. Um, while I was up at the podium, I failed to mention that we do have a replacement for the water utility. I talked to Chris Adams uh, recently. He is, was recommended by Dave, and uh, he has uh, agreed to fill out Dave's term uh, subject to your approval. And so I would uh, recommend that Chris Adams be the village's water utility representative. I need a second. Second. Thank you, Colleen. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of appointing Chris Adams to the water utility board indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Chris and I thank you. Um, <coughs> I don't see anyone from the plan commission. Is there anything that needs to be, as far as you know? Plan commission didn't meet in didn't December. Meet. <coughs> um, Personnel and Finance Committee met a little while ago, and uh, we will have a few topics to bring to your, uh, uh, for your approval. Uh, the first uh, of which is, well, actually, we this month we have two uh, uh, two spending amounts for you. And I would ask uh, one of our members of the Finance Committee if they will read that motion, and then we'll explain it and vote on it. Um, I move approval of the December 2010 non recurring claims in the total amount of $33,356.50. 
I'll second that. Thank you. Um, that amount, the 33 plus, is for the December 2010 non reoccurring claims. It's important to note that that is December of 2010 because in a moment we'll, we have uh, some non recurring claims for, I guess you could say, for January. These are 2011. Okay, any questions or co comments on the bills that are before you? I, I have a question uh, regarding Gloria's comments when you're referring to snow removal and the dollar amount. Was that for the entire month of December? You, see, you said snowstorm, but did you? It would have had some of, well. Or up to this point since we started plowing snow. No, it's it would be more than than that if we it was probably for the month of December. Okay. I'd say that's closer. Yeah, but um, not including the beginning of the year amounts or or any of those. And picking up on that, that would include not only uh, that would include overtime for our own guys too, wouldn't it? Correct. I have already signed some checks. I couldn't get over how big some of those checks were that I've already signed for some of our vendors. We had three. And uh, when I got the call, um, Dar uh, Doug, when I got the call from the Hards Hudson Star Observer, I was reluctant to quote <coughs> those numbers because I knew that we had overtime included in that, and Randy had asked for some additional information. And anything that goes in the paper, is when it comes to dollars and cents, I want to make sure it's right. So... I'm sure he got it by now. You probably yes, we did, we did have a conversation, and he uh, he's looking at it in a different aspect than what I presented. So. The story's already done, so I'm not uh, <laughs> sure what the numbers look like. <laughs> yeah, we'll find out what the numbers look like. <laughs> okay, uh, this being a spending question, we will start with you, Mr. Zappa. Aye. Yes. 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 Thank you. Uh, the second set, or uh, the second is actually only one fund, the general fund. Uh, I would ask for a motion on that one as well. I would uh, move to approve the 2011 non reoccurring claims received in December 2010, $4,714.35. And that motion was seconded by? Me. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Any questions on this one? Wouldn't it be fantastic if every month we could ask you to vote on a $4,700 bill? All right. This time, Stan, we'll start with you. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yes. 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 Very good. Um, the next, we have a couple resolutions. Um, because they're on the agenda, I'll read them and uh, also make a motion to postpone. Uh, the first resolution of the year would be discontinuing the collection of the library impact fees. And uh, I'm asking that we uh, postpone, I'll make the motion that we postpone uh, that uh, resolution until, hopefully, until next month. I'll second that. Thank you, Jim. And all in favor of postponing, postponing that resolution indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, aye. same sign. Uh, yes, sir. What were the village and the city were the only two that were collecting that impact fee, and uh, there actually I'd rather wait with that discussion until after we get a resolution that will have all the detail in it. Uh, would that be appropriate? To it's certainly yeah, appropriate uh, to wait until you have yeah, a resolution. Yeah, I want to have that you. resolution. All we're doing tonight is tabling it. Yeah, we're, discussion. Not, we're not ready for that 
discussion at this time. It should be on next month's agenda, and you'll be able to see it at that point and make comments or have discussion. Okay. The second resolution is revising the North Hudson fee schedule, and uh, uh, I'd have to make the same comment. We are not prepared to uh, discuss that at this time, and so I will make the motion that we postpone that. Uh, until next month as well. Second. Thank you, Mark. Um, all in favor of postponing this resolution, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Next one we have, uh, there will be some more discussion on this, uh, and it will be led by Joe. It has to do with the Hudson Area Fire Protection Agreement. And Joe, I'm going to turn this over to you. Uh, but before I do, just indicate there to the other board members that you should have in front of you the most recent. Everybody has that, right? Put that on, on the table. Yes. Um, this is the, uh, just so that you have the whole packet, it's about a, there are five sheet, or excuse me, there are five, six pages to this. The last two pages are the, uh, the annual fee calculation, which you may have seen once before. Um, this one came in uh, literally yesterday. Is that, I think it was yesterday we got that, wasn't it? Yeah. So, Joe, you want to talk about this a little bit? Yeah. Can I give about a three or four sentence summary of uh, where we've been and where we think we are now? And uh, hopefully it'll, it'll, it'll make sense. Uh, normally, uh, the village approves about this time each year a one-year contract with the city of Hudson for our fire protection. And we've been doing that for a number of years. Uh, there are about, I think there, there's uh, four organizations, the town of Troy, North Hudson, the town of Hudson, the city of Hudson, that make up the, uh, the community that uses the, those facilities. And it's essentially controlled by the city of Hudson. And so we pay the city of Hudson so much a year for our fire protection. And uh, as we were looking at it as members of the fire board, I'm, I'm on the fire board, we were, we were looking at it and we were thinking there, there could be some adjustment in cost there based on usage. Essentially now, the, the way the fire contract is written, is that we are billed um, by the city of Hudson or the contract is written as a percent of our, our valuation in the community, that what our property values are totally worth. And so they use that as a percentage and then they prorate <coughs> that to the, to, the, to the other organizations. Um, however, if we looked at the number of fire runs that actually come into North Hudson or the surrounding communities, it seemed to us that, or that our members of the fire board that some adjustment could be made because we don't use it as much as perhaps the city of Hudson does. And so we looked at that over several month period and then we started negotiating with the, with the city and, uh, and they agreed to rework the contract based on that. And so this new contract that you have before you is based on um, the next year, it's based on 75% on the valuation and then 25% on the average five-year runs to our community. That is how much we're really using it. And the next year following, it will, base, will be based on 50% on our valuation and 50% on the average five-year run. And those numbers obviously will change and they'll be recalculated each year. What that means, bottom line for us, is our, uh, our fire contract cost will go down some $6,000 this year and a like amount in 2012. It's right now about $94,000 and it will be close to $88,000 if we approve this contract. Now, Having said that, when the city looked at those dollars, they, they wanted some protection of their own, 
because they're the ones that actually pay the bills uh, for capital, for for everything, for insurance and, and for the equipment and for the building that, uh, the, that all this stuff is housed in. So they wanted some protection that would indicate that the village or the other municipalities were going to be around and support that uh, payment of that uh, uh, facility or facilities uh, for the, at least the next five years. And then any capital equipment that was, uh, uh, that was agreed upon by the fire board and, and the surrounding communities would be prorated as in terms of the schedule for that particular piece of capital equipment. At issue with us and the rest of the municipalities is there's some talk that there may be a building built for the fire department in the future. And we're mainly concerned about what our responsibility would be if the city did that. And would we have to pay for that based on this new contract? And so it was written in there that this contract, that this contract would still be in effect, however, the negotiation for that particular lease or particular uh, uh, facility would have to be agreed upon through a separate contract with the city and the village. Now that's all very, very complicated uh, when you look at the, the, the contract and as, as we were looking at it over the last few months. And the reason that we've had, every time, every time that we make some subtle changes to it, then it goes back to the city council and they make changes to it and then we have to look at it again and perhaps make changes to it. So this is at least the third or fourth revision to it. Um, I won't get into what each revision was because I'm not sure that I could remember them all to tell you the truth. But essentially we think it's fair, I think it's fair for the village, this contract protects us as well as protects the city. And the fact that it, it essentially says we're going to have a rolling five-year agreement between the city and the, these municipalities that support it, that also supports the municipalities because we know that they're also committed for five years. If they dropped out for some reason or another and our costs go up, then you know it's going to be tough on everybody. But I think this is, it's, I think the city needs us we need them and we also need the surrounding communities to cooperate so that we have a good fire protection uh, uh, response and uh, facilities and personnel, trained personnel that, that, that can help us in this, in this regard. So I'm in favor of this contract. I know Terry, you've had maybe 30 minutes to look it over. You may have some comments about it. But does it, before, I, before he says anything, does anybody have any questions on this? Because I'm going to be recommending that we do approve it. Okay, Yeah, Terry? Joe, Joe I, yes. would agree, I would agree with the, the discussion we had in finance. I, I agree <coughs> with you too. And I understand the analysis that you just went, went through about the number of calls, but it's, but it's interesting um, to, li to listen to you say maybe there's some adjustment that could be there because we haven't had as many fire calls as somebody else. Frankly, I just assumed we never had a fire call. I just assumed we never, ever used it. Oh, yeah. Which would mean we had no fires. Yeah. So to say, you know what, we haven't had many fires, so maybe our cost should go down is an interesting um, analysis. Yeah. Go ahead, Terry. Uh, Terry? <coughs> Terry, if you've got some comments. Yeah, I, I would say that um, I didn't have a lot of time to look at this, so that would be my first comment. Um, I got it late yesterday and um, looked at it this afternoon, and Gloria and I talked about it a little bit. Uh, as, as, far as, as far as what I read, I think it's all okay from a kind of a legal standpoint. Uh, there were some areas where I saw a few little minor things that probably should be fixed. It says a town in one place rather than the village and things like that. But, I mean, that, that doesn't make it an illegal contract or anything, yeah, right. something George like that. George found that, too. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, little, a, a little first. thing. That's minor. Mm -hmm. uh, and just also I would say, so everybody understands mm -hmm. from the policy standpoint, uh, you know, you, this is a five-year lock-in, and it's sort of forever a five-year lock-in. So it's going to take four and a half years to get out of it. That's, that's what you're agreeing to at any given point. Ten years down the road you want out, you got to give them four and a half years' notice to get out. So that's the first thing I would just 
make sure everybody's aware of that. If we can respond to that. Yeah. Uh, Joe alluded to it. I'll, uh, when I first saw the, one of the previous contracts had <coughs> 10 years. It was 10, right. It was a 10-year rolling contract, and my initial re uh, reaction was a lot like yours until I realized, uh, yeah, it locked us in, but it also locked in those other two municipalities that the city serves. You bet. So it's actually protecting us as well. Okay. Yep. Next. And and I, I agree with that, George. And I, you know, I don't. I, it's not my place to make a policy decision. Right. That's that's your guys' role. Yep. Yep. You know, that's why you're elected. Uh, I would also say just to point out that you know, under the capital expenses part, that um, if it, you don't have a lot of control over that. In fact, you have no control over that. The fire board and then the city will make the decision on what capital expenses to, to spend the money on, and you will get locked into that. Uh, if it's under a million, it'll be for 10 years. If it's over a million, it might be for 20. I couldn't imagine what a capital expense over a million dollars would be other than pot, you know a building or a, building a new building and fire hall, but that's covered in a different provision, so I, I just I can't even imagine what, what that million dollar... <coughs> limit might be I, I talked to Joe about that a little bit but he they didn't really have any ideas about us an example of what they might spend more than a million dollars that's on. a good sign yeah that's yeah. a good sign we can't think of why you would spend a million dollars either. but the one we thing to keep in mind there is even if you do give four and a half years notice to get out you're still going to be locked into that 10 years of paying those capital expenses so just just so you're aware of that um I found number seven a little hard to follow. Uh, you know, Gloria and I talked about this, the calculations on under A1 and 2, although it, in combination with Exhibit A, you can work it out. I thought the language could have been a little more clear, though, about what exactly those, uh, those formulas are in A1 and 2. So if I had more time, I would want to suggest that their attorney tighten that language up a little bit. Uh, but I, I don't think it's a, it's a deal killer. And then the last thing I thought under number 10, I wanted to just comment that on that. That's, uh, that's the building and the land. Um, it's kind of nebulous what, it, what might come out of that. So I can't really give you a good opinion on that. It, it says the, the municipalities will agree to negotiate. That's basically what it says. And uh, it doesn't say that you have to come to some agreement at the end of that negotiation, although there is some language in there that sort of seems to assume everybody ought to be paying a fair share of that building. And so it's kind of hard to say what could come of that. Uh, uh, at, at least it, it doesn't lock us in, so that's probably a really positive thing. It doesn't lock us in to, to agreeing to any specific part of a, of a building. Um, but I think it does lock us into at least negotiating in good faith with the city if they decide to build a building, build a new building. Uh, and then the last comment I had when I was reading through it was just that if the city chooses to terminate, they, they can kick us out uh, with four and a half years' notice, but we're still on the hook for the 10 years of capital expenses if there are any. So that was the other comment I just wanted to make to make sure everybody had, had read that or if you hadn't read it so you were aware of that. So there's, there's that kind of, we could still be on the hook for five years even though we're not even using the things we're paying for anymore. Other than that, I really don't have any co other comments on this. It, it's, you know, it's a reasonable language. And I view it as being mutually protective. A absolutely. I mean, it is, of, of course it's protecting the provider of, of the service, but it's protecting us as the receiver of the service as well. Even, even with regard to the building, I mean, it would be absolutely unreasonable of any of the receivers of the services here to say, we expect you to be available with new equipment to come and fight our fire, but we uh, don't think you ought to have a building to house and maintain the equipment. So, I mean, it's I, I view it as mutually protective. The only other comment that I have is where it says um, that uh, if uh, they exhaust all their services that the village yeah. will pay for any additional suppression. I think that it's important that um, we get a ordinance in place that puts that burden back, back on, on the, the owner. owner. Yes, we talked about that before and I was thinking we were going to do that or did do it. It's on the to-do list. Okay. 
Yeah. And that came about after the uh, fire yes, at the warehouse. Fire. The reason that yeah. the reason that paragraph is in there is because, because of, that, of that. Because of that one. Yeah. yeah, that was very expensive. Although we we were able and would have been able to collect against the property owner anyway, just because there's a state statute that gave us the right to do that. Mm -hmm. But what it would do to have that ordinance would be to help the that would have helped that property owner in that case because he had to fight with his insurance company and they said, oh well, if the village doesn't have an ordinance, we're not going to pay you. And so he had to get in a little argument with them. So it would have helped our village resident had we had that ordinance. Yeah, whatever it is that needs to be cleaned up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And the statute's not very clear. It, well, I, I think that was a reasonably good discussion. Could I make a motion to accept this? You so, sure can, Joe. Uh, I move that uh, the village approve the 2011 Village of North Hudson and City of Hudson Fire Protection Contract. Second. Any further discussion? Because this is a contract, I would like to uh, call for a roll call vote. And so I'll start with Mr. Zappa. Yes. 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 Sounds like it passed. Should Thank we? You very Thank much. you, Terry, for the unanimous summary to that vote. Yeah, now my question on this before we move on, Joe, is, although it's a minor point, um, uh, on this one? And Terry, maybe I would be asking you mm -hmm. the one that I will be required, uh, requested to sign. Can I do something like this where I just cross out the word town? Well, that word probably village? should have been maybe part of the motion with one exception or something like that, but it, it, it wouldn't affect the, uh, I didn't the enforceability of the contract right. either way. But so. if I just cross that out. And it's all right. Sure. Sort of like a, I'm used to doing, you know, and then GK right. next how, to how it. How about another motion that just says, with the one exception that we, where it refers to the town, we change that to village. Could we just take another vote on that just to, okay. just yeah. to make it all clean? Yeah, I modify my motion to include that. In item number item three, number where three, it says town, town should, be village. should be village. Could you take care of that, Becky? Yep. Okay. okay. Can we do that in a voice vote? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Daryl, we should have would a you second. Do you agree okay with seconding that? Yeah. yeah. Can we do a voice sure. vote? All in favor of uh, the motion to change the word town and item number three to village, indicate by saying aye. 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 Both same sign. Um, that's, that's letter D. And we are not yet ready to uh, present anything from the... Uh, or the uh, Hudson, <coughs> or the Village of North Hudson Professional Police Association contract. So I would ask, for, I'll make the motion that we postpone that until uh, such time as we are ready. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Colleen. All in favor of the motion to postpone item E, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank you. Public Works, uh, I don't see anything here. In the not meet in December. Then, uh, I think they were busy. I think the Public Works <laughs> boys were busy enough, weren't they? Yeah. Thank you, Darrell. Public Safety, I do see uh, a couple items in here that uh, a representative from the uh, Public Safety Committee may want to comment on. Do you? Anything you want to say, Joe? Well, I was going to say a couple of things. I, I sort of figured you would. Really? Huh. Okay. <coughs> if I don't say them, you'll say them, right? Exactly. Okay. Well, um, one of the things that I think people should be aware of is uh, in terms of new business, that, on, and this is for not the board but the community, yep. is that on December 1st, 2010, the law prohibiting texting while driving went into effect. This new statute falls under, I'm just reading this here, uh, <coughs> inattentive driving, which has already been adopted by the North Hudson Municipal Code, so no additional changes need to be made in order to enforce this law in municipal court. So I'm saying that uh, as, as uh, just to let everybody know that that ordinance exists here and you know, you should attempt to abide by it. Um, I also believe this isn't part of our meeting minutes, but also I think that there was, I think there was an ordinance 
or a state statute passed that we also, that our police officers can now ask for proof of insurance. That's correct. And people need to know that they need to, they may need to, prov- they may be asked for that. And my guess, if you're stopped in the village of North Hudson, you will be asked for that for proof of insurance. Now, prior to, you know, this year, I, they haven't been asking for that, but they are going to be asking for that in the future. So I would encourage everybody to get your insurance cards updated as needed during the course of the year. Now, I don't if your insurance works like mine, I think mine is renewable every six months, so I get cards every six months. Make sure those are up to date. That's for your own protection. And Doug, I don't know if you can, if you would make sure that that, that gets in the, uh, the paper or not, but I think that would be a public service to everybody. Uh, it would just make it a lot easier on everybody if they could follow that. Along with the texting. Yes. That's the only two things that I thought was uh, noteworthy to bring out, but George, you may have some other comments. That was it. I wanted to make sure that we brought Geez, the I passed the test. You passed the test. It's almost like a driving do I, test. Do I get it? a star or anything? Or? Um, only if you join the police department. Okay. We'll give you a star. Okay. Thank you, George. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Joe. Anybody have any comments about that? My son and I were coming back uh, from Minneapolis earlier today, and we're on 94, and there was a traffic jam up, and we looked at the car in front of us. There was at least two car lengths in front of us, and it's a stop-and-go traffic, and Pete said, I bet the driver of that car is texting. Sure enough, (laughs) that's exactly what it was. Inattentive driving. All right. Thank you very much, Joe, and we move on. Number 11, Park Board. We didn't meet in December. Would that mean, Colleen, that you have no report? Right. Thank you. Okay, moving right along. Um, back up. Did oh, we back miss up. One? Back I up. We missed sorry, one. I missed mm-hmm. one. Public welfare. I know that Jim has something to present to us. Uh, A couple years ago, uh, the village elected to uh, put together a voice messaging system with a company called XM Voice, uh, which time the system worked well, and they subsequently have gone out of business. So uh, when we have uh, made our last attempt to put out a message, uh, we found that there was nobody to contact to put that message together with. So the good news of this is that we had utilized the majority of our budget so uh, we didn't get caught um, uh, financially with our pants down. But uh, I, we researched a replacement company and uh, after uh, completing that we found that there's a company called Call Fire which ironically offers a, a better service and more flexibility than XM Voice actually did. So uh, ironically, this is turning out to be a a good thing. Um, So we don't get into the same situation that we did back then. What um, I am going to request from the board or what public welfare would request would be um, a budget of $500 for the 2012 year of which I doubt whether we'll use that up, but we will utilize it in $100 increments. Um, Just with the volatility of these companies, we don't want to have the same situation occur, and $100 will get us at least two sessions of uh, of voice messages. Um, The the history of this is that uh, this call service has worked rather well for us in the past for little things like Christmas tree pickup, uh, odds and ends. A particular one that comes to mind is back on uh, December 7th, we did an aerial survey of the village uh, with a helicopter for two and a half hours and um, ironically got a few phone calls. Most of those were directed to the elementary school, but uh, had we had the ability to put out a public service message to the residents, everybody would have been aware that it wasn't a uh, situation that uh, uh, had to be of any concern, but rather was just a survey. So the the program has really seemed to have uh, worked well over the years, and uh, I think there's definitely a need to keep it going. 
So with that, I would uh, move, uh, I would request or ask the board for an approval of a voice broadcasting system with call fire with a budget of $500 to be distributed in $100 increments. Second. Any discussion? Just put it in sense of, in point of dollars and cents, uh, we could make 1,200 calls, which is most of the village. It costs forty two dollars. Excuse me. Um, sounds like a good deal. Uh, Stan? How many people are on the village list? I mean as far as residents, what's the percentage of participation? Right now, very low, but I'll let I defer to Jim and uh, Glory on this. Okay. Uh, currently when we put this out we touch about twelve hundred people or twelve hundred residents. Um, the statistics that I'd gotten before uh, we were hitting 60% of those people were listening to the messages. Um, so it's a fairly good amount. What we're going to be working on going forward is trying to come up with a more refined call list so that we can um, reach more people. The other advantage to call fire as opposed to XM voice if you simply don't want to be informed of, of community service announcements that could benefit you, at the end of the message, you can opt out by hitting, I believe it's number eight. Uh, we'll get this uh, confirmed, but you can opt out of the program. So if you simply don't want to be disturbed, that's an option. So, but, so they're gonna, where are they going to get the numbers so that I can opt out? I mean... Why are they going to get my phone number to call if I don't, you know? I mean, we did this, I don't know how many years ago. The village ran a, uh, they asked for information, phone numbers, blah, blah, whatever they wanted, and I don't think there was a great response to it. I just, I, <clears throat> I don't, I think this is a redundant, and, you know, it's not much money, there's no doubt, but I just don't, uh, you know, I'm not getting in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what it really leads to is, is a community involvement. Um, if one person gets it and they're out talking <coughs> to their neighbor and they say, hey, did you hear about this? It, it creates that environment that, that solid communities are built on. And uh, if people don't want it, they can opt out at the first opportunity. As a village, um, we're not soliciting anybody. We're doing this exclusively for uh, community awareness. So. We do have that uh, yeah, right. Can I uh, ask a question? Certainly. These numbers are protected, are they not? I mean, we don't give the list out to anybody, right? No. Is it people who have already agreed to be on the list? Um, or is it going through the phone book? How do they get the numbers in the first place? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Um, initially, um, Gloria, do you want to field this one? <laughs> I'll let you do it. Um, there was a combination. <coughs> Um, but we did do the survey, and I felt that we had a, a large number of uh, reports or um, slips returned. I haven't counted them, which I, we can do to give you a better feel for how many we actually got turned back in. Um, but one of the problems I felt with that form was it was asking for additional information that if <coughs> I was a resident, I would not have completed and I don't know if people felt like if they didn't complete the whole thing, they couldn't complete part of it. So we have revised the form to only in ask for name, address, and phone number, um, and not medical needs or um, any type of fire information that we have no ability to do with it, anything with anyway. Um, we would like to maybe ask some questions at the county level to see how they addressed coming up with their their numbers. Mm -hmm. Because I don't believe they went to each and yeah. every person on there. So the county already has one in, <coughs> in force. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Have so, you used it yet? Because yeah. I don't remember getting a, ever getting a, a call from the county. It may not have been something that impacted the village president. Okay, yeah, but to reiter my, reiterate my point is we are not giving this list out to anybody. No. We're using it for I community service. 
Carrie, I, I don't know what the laws are with this. I mean, we do have open records request, and that was our, our philosophy with going and asking people for their numbers was that if somebody did come in, we had their permission and if, if they had asked for a list. I, I think that is something that... But um, even open records, if somebody says, I want to know everybody on this list, we wouldn't give that out, would we? I'm not, I'm not sure the answer to that. Really? I'll have to <coughs> I think I we find had that to, to look at that, and that was the reason for having them complete the form and agreeing so that mm -hmm. they knew that it was a possibility that if somebody came in and said, I want that list, yeah. That so we may what, have. what's the percentage of people who responded? I, I can't, on the papers, I don't know without counting them. Did you count? I'd say it was probably maybe a fifth to a sixth mark of the, of of the, the village total residents. residents. Yeah, just that's a pretty close guess. Well, I'm going to, you know, I, I like the idea of it. I like the idea of this. It just makes our job in, in the village a lot easier, and particularly the administration of, of items that need to get out in public view. No, I, d I disagree I, I like because it. a lot of that stuff has to be printed, and le does it, leaving a phone message constitutes the same obligation no. as a written message to somebody. If, say if you say if no. you got to go to a planning commission meeting and you're one of a, a resident within the, the viewed property or the property in question, Will that phone message oh, save a letter? We wouldn't be using it for, be using for meetings or anything like okay, that. It's so basically, hey, just like tonight, Amber Christmas alerts. trees. You know, send out your, you know, put out your Christmas tree on the next, you know, two or three Fridays, and it'll get picked up. There was actually parents was, concerned could, about those helicopters. <clears throat> they thought there was a, an escapee from across the river, loose, and because that's what happens, they send helicopters over the area. And so there was a lot of very concerned parents. I, I think that it is, and, and we do hear here a lot that they don't feel that we get enough information to them even though we put things in the paper yeah. and we put things on the website and we do everything that we can yeah, do. Yeah, well, do you, well, this, I'm going to digress just for a moment. Sure. But the continual chasing of trying to give people information is going to lead to the continual complaining of not getting enough, in my opinion, because it's changed through the years. You guys get it up. I, I the five hundred dollars. It's it's a it's a small amount. I just I hope it doesn't get much past that. It gets given the level well, of participation. Well, if you think about when we used to send out newsletters and a postage stamp, it was costing six to seven hundred dollars to do mailings. There well, are that's not counting the labor. Yeah. And I'm not talking about again public notices, but informational. Yeah. They used to mail all those out and the postage has gotten so high. I mean, there there is a, a offset to some of these new technologies that you may have I, to pay five, spend $500 a year versus every time you do a mailing. That, of that sort of information is, is, is helpful to me, but some of the comments and how it's being used I thought were not a real high priority. A nice convenience for people, sure, but we struggle with a tough budget each year. So I find it a bit ironic that uh, the taxpayers were trying to protect financially where we have to phone them with information. I mean, I, I, I view the whole process as a two-way street between what goes on down here and the residents. Like I guess I'm not going to, it, it's a marginal amount of money and, and it's in the right direction. Like I think say. when we first looked at this, it was a cost savings to us to go to this system rather than the three or four mm -hmm. mailings that we thought were going to be mandatory each year and just and just looking at the postage. I like, the, I'm just going to say again, I like the idea. I, I think it's a good service for the community and it's a good service for the residents. I, and Jim has put a lot of work into this over the years. And I think even the county, you, you were talking to somebody at the county after we initiated it and they said, I didn't know this system worked like that. And so I think they copied it. And so I think it works. I think it's good. I'm concerned that that list uh, needs to be protected somehow. And I think we need to look into that and make sure that because of 
open, you know, it, it isn't an open meeting. It's not a meeting that we're having. So I don't know anybody's right to have that list. But uh, that, I, I we'll think we need to look at because I, it, there's a second law. There's open meetings, but completely yeah. unrelated to that there's the open records law yeah. where most government, most local yeah. government documents are open. Yeah. There's well, very few things in, just in the payroll that are not some privacy things. Right. Yeah. So maybe this, maybe some of this fits into I, the privacy exception. I think we so need. I think that. we need to look at that because and tighten that up somehow. If we got to pass an ordinance about this, that's fine with me. I would like to see it go ahead because I think it's good. But that's that's just me talking. I'd like to respond to the issue that you've raised about the open meeting and the phone number list. If anybody wants the phone number list, they can open up a phone book for all the landlines that are in there unless, of course, you have uh, told the phone company, I don't want my name in the phone book. I, other people will, will ask, yeah. um, I don't want my landline being used. I want you to call me on my cell phone. Yeah. So there are those things, and maybe, just maybe, if people are concerned about that and don't want that cell number out, then they're not part of this program, yeah. or we just use a landline if they still have one. Yeah. Uh, this board has been, ever since I've been on the board, I've heard criticisms that we uh, fail in the area of communication. And then I start to list all the ways that we try to communicate. And there are always reasons why, well, I don't get the paper, or I don't have internet, or I don't do this. And Mark, it comes right down to what you were saying before. We've gone the extra mile. I don't know what else you could want. This is just one more, um, shall we say, arrow in the quiver here where we can, hopefully we can hit our mark with reaching some people who don't have access in those other ways. I'll, I'll support this, uh, especially since it's as inexpensive as it is. I'd like to uh, summarize <clears throat> by um, saying these are this is a really good discussion because you know like what you brought up mark is you know forty two dollars thirty dollars whatever it is to reach everybody um you know it, it is on a tough budget i i don't disagree um but if it does save becky and gloria a few hours of time or more you know and and postage whatever it it is something that can be justified but, but more importantly than that, I guess my, I would direct this to Terry. Um, you know, everybody is facing data privacy collection policies right now. And it would be interesting to see if uh, these data privacy policies would override what we have to do, you know, as a government body. Because, I mean, there comes a point where, where we do have to protect people's information and I know that that you know I'm new on the board relatively but as as a government I, I find it hard to believe that we are forced into giving out things that you know really aren't people's business and if you could look into that I'd, I would feel more comfortable there's, there's definitely some privacy exceptions but they're not you know absolute so it's something I'll just have to double check you know and as I you know reach out to the public you know by no means is this list you know, get out to anybody that, um, you know, we, we wouldn't want to get to. It's simply there. Um, if Mark Richard had some type of a, a public safety issue, we can put a, a message out in literally in minutes and get it out to people. It's a relatively inexpensive way of doing it. Um, and, uh, and it's easy. It's, uh, it's effective and it's easy. But uh, all good concerns. I look at this as if there's an amber alert and we can send it out and save one child. It's it's worth more than anybody yeah. put a dollar sign on. That's a good example. So, all right. By the way, the uh, what we're doing tonight, Finance Committee did discuss this topic uh, this evening, and uh, this is the first step in the process. We've asked Jim if he could uh, contact the company and put together a contract. Um, that uh, would protect us, um, and it just it seems to me it's good municipal business if you're dealing with an entity to make sure you have a contract. So this is the vote uh, that you cast tonight. Will if it's a yes, then it will simply provide Jim with the uh, opportunity to go ahead and contact the company to get that contract. All right. 
And so uh, because this is a, in some degree, a spending, I'm going to ask for a roll call vote this time. Why don't we start with Stan? No. Yeah. Yes. 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 Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, and as far as business goes, that's all I've got. I unfortunately have had some family issues and haven't been uh, a big part of the board the last couple months. But uh, I did want to just cover really quickly the aerial survey that we did uh, uh, put together on the um, 9th of December uh, and the findings from it. Uh, basically, the simple um, observation we had uh, in a two-hour period um, from 745 to 945, we had positive sightings of 70 deer. Um, these were real numbers, not... Uh, accounting for ones that you obviously can't see in dense pine forests, forests and what have you. 26 of these deer were on the east side of Main Street. 44 of them were on the west side of Main Street. Um, the, um, the day that we were out, we had great snow cover, made everything, it made the deer very easy to see. Uh, there was a pilot, a spotter, and myself keeping records. And um, it uh, indicates we do still have quite an amount of deer. Uh, the one thing that we did see from the air, which is pretty obvious, uh, uh, over by the St. Croix River, um, um, towards the north part of the village, there's a lot where we saw multiple deer feeders that were out. And although feeding deer is not an illegal action at this point, we don't have any 45 mile an hour zones, we are going to continue to ask residents to use common sense with this um, because it just continues to change the natural habitat of deer. It draws them across roads, which can lead to issues. Um, uh, you know, in the southern part of the state, they have outlawed feeding because of chronic wasting disease. Anytime <clears throat> you have deer, eating out of the same area. If one of them is diseased, it has a tendency of transferring that disease. So we just ask people if we can uh, let the deer do their natural thing, I think that we could potentially eliminate this program a few years down the road and everything will take care of itself. But uh, that's all I have. Jim, is there a, what the DNR would consider to be an ideal number for the village? I believe it was less than 60. Yes. Oh, less than 30 per mile. per mile. Okay, I'm sorry. Was it 30 per square mile? Yeah. In this area. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, so you all received a map too, and the camera operator indicated that he could zoom in on the map oh, yeah. there on the on posted on the wall. So maybe the residents can see the map and and where most of the deer had been sighted. And the total was 70. Yeah, the total uh, during that two-hour period was 70 deer. And uh, I don't know if the cameraman can actually zoom in on that. It's uh, sort of an interesting thing. But basically, they're residing um, in the wooded areas. Uh, sounds good. Oh, okay, sounds good. It's a little difficult to see, but um, on the Maybe east side. On it. What's that? We'll open point on it. I could do that. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. I'll uh, do this real quickly. Take the mic, Jim. All right. So what we've basically got, oh, here, hold on. Stand to the side of it, though, yeah, by the way. Exactly. In this area right here, which is the eastern part of the, uh, the village, we basically had about 15 deer sighted. Um, this is a pretty heavily wooded area, and it's a good habitat for deer. And in all honesty, having, you know, uh, 15 deer in that area um, was not really too bad. We had seven more up in this area, four down here, which brought us to a total of 26. And what we used is Main Street as a dividing or reference point. Um, in this area, um, obviously we've got quite a few more deer. We had about 20 deer right up in there, and then 25 deer right in here. These are where we were able to spot feeders from the air, and it obviously I shouldn't say obviously, it appeared to have an impact on the, the patterns of the deer. So it's sort of our contention if we, could, if we could just let everybody share in the joy of seeing deer without trying to bring them in, everybody would be able to enjoy it and uh, 
and hopefully we'd get to a point where uh, they would just sort of naturally reduce the populations. But that's all I've got. Good information. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Oh. Well, I think this ends the first meeting of 2011. Hey. Would you, you want me to mention? Yeah. I could read it. Sure. All right. At the uh, behind the uh, last uh, uh, tab in your binder is the this document. Uh, this comes from uh, Lavane Hessler, who is the Community Services Specialist for the uh, Department of Natural Resources. I have reviewed the outdoor recreation plan prepared for the North Hudson. I'm reading exactly as it's written, by the way. The plan and the resolution of adoption are satisfactory. The Village of North Hudson will be eligible to participate in the Land and Water Conservation Fund program the Stewardship Acquisition and Development of Local Parks Program, and other outdoor recreation grant in aid programs through December 31st, 2013. Please remember that eligibility is no assurance that you will receive funding under any of these programs for any particular project. Thank you for submitting the plan and resolution of adoption. If you have any questions, give me a call. So it would seem here that our outdoor recreation plan was received well. Anybody have any comments or questions? If not, Mr. Zappo, you have anything you'd like to say? <laughs> Do I hear a second? Yes. <laughs> All in favor of adjourning this meeting indicate by saying aye. 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 Good night, everyone. See you in February. Good seeing you, Terry.